Oh, uh, there's a whole lot of people who turned up and were outside the other side of the glass. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> well, we like to tickle people's fancies. <laughs> okay, take care, buddy. See ya. Bye. We set out to do something which we didn't really quite have the resources to do. And I knew that we would take ourselves to the edge of the cliff financially at some point in that process. It did make you feel as though you were about to fall into a big dark hole and perhaps never come out of it. Anyway, it's time for me to punch now, dig your lady, you take care, whatever you do, make sure you take it and trust the energy, because the energy says it's radio, not geography. We were renting in uh, Fitzroy, and um, that building was bought by the Southern School of Natural Therapies. Late 2002, they indicated that uh, it was unlikely that our lease would be renewed. Are you ready for a joint? Uh, I'll, I'll just chill out for a little while. Yeah, I understand. It was really clear from the first meeting that what we really wanted to do was buy a building. We wanted to have a place that was Triple R's own place. And I really clearly remember the day of driving up to the Blythe and Nicholson Street set of lights and seeing the auction sign on this particular building. We figured that we could afford about one million dollars and we wanted something that was around a thousand square meters and when I told real estate agents that most of them just laughed at me. And I walked through the back door which was where the CD library now is and went I think this will do. <laughs> A number of other people came along to the auction, including people like Jeff King, our chair, who's been involved in Triple R since almost the very beginning, and who has been fantastic and solid right throughout this process, particularly when I had severe anxiety attacks. And I was so nervous about the auction that I said they were welcome to come, but they couldn't stand near me. The only person that could stand near me was Philippa. And the auctioneer came back in with the uh, vendor and said we'd like to say that uh, the property is now on the market and the highest bid is with these two young ladies here. Which was appropriate for Philippa but I'd well past being a young lass by that stage. Which broke the tension somewhat <laughs> but we did have to refocus on the task at hand. So in the end we got it for 945000 which was a great price for the market at that time. And it, quite an emotional feeling to say congratulations it's yours. But in the back of my mind there were all these questions about the money it would take to do it, the fact that we wouldn't be able to do it in an ideal way, we wouldn't be able to have project managers, we wouldn't be able to put the capital together and then do the build, that we would have to do it slowly and it would take us a number of years. We had undertaken a huge fundraising drive for the move generally. We knew that we weren't sure whether we would rent or buy, but we knew whichever way we went, we needed to raise the money to be able to fit out whichever space we landed in. I remember a slightly sort of hair-raising meeting in the back room of Triple R with um, our architects and Philip Overgard and Andrew Croke, who were really the two key people who I worked with through the project of relocation. And the timeline just kept getting pushed further and further and further and we got closer and closer and closer to the point where we absolutely had to be out of Fitzroy and things like the building didn't have a roof yet. I just remember at some stage, and these were fairly stressful times, sort of thinking if we don't start building now, we're completely fucked. Mario and Mario from uh, Mario's Cafe around the corner in Fitzroy and long-term supporters. Uh, they had a set of uh, posters that had been from the Continental, all autographed. They rang me up and said, look, we'd like to do something like an auction and raise funds. And we raised about 35000 from the Continental poster auction. And that was in 
2005 at a point where I was really struggling to pay the wages bill. I was really wobbling on the edge of the cliff. There was probably about a hundred volunteers on top of our normal existing broadcasting and non-broadcasting volunteers that helped. And Ludi Adam played a huge part in that. She was the administrator here at the time and we organised big packing days. I think we ended up with two and a half thousand boxes moved from Fitzroy to Brunswick. You know, Viv Lees rang up from Big Day Out and said in Viv's incredibly sort of quiet way, I hear you're doing some pretty long hours. And uh, I said, yeah, but you know, it's, it's good you know, trying to sound convincing. And uh, he said, would 20,000 help? Catherine, I couldn't move away from the fact that we both felt very strongly that the studios were the heart of the station and therefore physically should be in the middle <laughs> of the entire building. Grand Mac Mackenzie's team from Sonoma were fantastic. Uh, Shane Smith, who was the site manager here, was um, just a fantastic person to work with. The Mark Healy from Six Degrees did a great job of working through the design with us. I said, great for us to talk, but you should talk to a whole range of staff and broadcasters. You should get a sense of what this place means to them, how they use it, what they do in it. And uh, he came back and said, Hmm, seems like they want something like a cross between Roar FM and Godspell. <laughs> When the switch from Fitzroy to Brunswick happened, and this sort of gives you a sense of how fine line everything was, uh, myself, Ludi Adam, a number of staff that were on staff at that time had spent the day trying to get the temporary studio ready for broadcast. You had to climb under the scaffold to get into the first studio, which we decided we had to have one studio we could broadcast from. With this old, desks that we got from RMIT, people had come out halfway through their show and say, does it sound okay? I, I've got no idea, the metres are all over the place. And I go, yeah, don't worry about the metres, it's fine. We'll come and tell you if something goes wrong. And the level of support and flexibility that the broadcasters gave us during that period was fantastic too. Sam O'Reilly had done an amazing sort of camping table job for the studio, but that was all there was in it. And I remember Lou being down on her hands and knees, vacuuming, pregnant at the time, vacuuming tiny bits of wire up that were sort of left from electrical work and madly trying to do all of this before seven o'clock. So we were actually here. Physically, I was in the green room with a bunch of other fabulous people that had helped get us here to see the first cross, which was quite a great feeling because it felt like Triple R had come back together again. <laughs> anyway, it's time for me to plant now. Dig you later. You take care. Whatever you do, make sure you take it and trust the energy because the energy says it's radio, not geography. <laughs> that round of applause cost me a fortune. <laughs> Nine three double eight one zero two seven. Triple R, Rumblick. Welcome Melbourne and Greater Melbourne on FM one zero two point seven, and all over the globe on triplerr.org.au. I'm Gary Seven. This is Smoke Me If You Got Him, and welcome to a new chapter in the Triple R story with our first, very first, virginal popping our cherry broadcast from the Brunswick studio. Uh, a few quick thanks are in order. Me thinks to get the ball rolling. Uh, it's really difficult to sum up what Kath has done for Triple R. She's, she's brought stability and fairness and good process and good ideology to the organisation. Her management skills are outstanding and her personal view on 
life, politics and fabulous shoes is also outstanding. And I think uh, in today's world of intense media control, with so few people having ownership of the media and its ideas, we're all very, very lucky indeed to have a station such as Triple R because it will forever belong to us. Melbourne's own 102.7 Triple R FM.